As we get ready to hear your word, open up our ears. Oh God, let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. Thank you for the word that's going to come with the messenger, anoint him afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. We're blessed this morning to have one of our very own pastors, uh, Dr. Terrence Bridges. I'm honored to have uh, the ability to call him my brother this morning. He is the founder and lead pastor of ReChurch in Charlotte. Uh, as a scholar and teacher, he is a graduate of Taylor University, holding a BA in pastoral ministries with minors in Christian education and biblical studies. He subs, subs, uh, subs, wait a minute, I can't read the prints, excuse me. He completed his MA in executive development followed by doctoral studies in Christian education, leadership, and a certificate of advanced graduate studies. His terminal degrees include an educational specialist degree and doctorate of education. His experience in ministry ranged from children and youth ministry, worship and arts, young adult ministry, to congregational life and Christian education leadership. He began serving in a ministerial capacity at the age of 13. At the time, at the time, one of his youngest music directors and worship leaders in several national international conferences. At 15, Dr. T was licensed to preach. At as a teen, Bridges led various ministries in worship at regional, national, and international gatherings. Praise the Lord. While his interests vary, his primary passion remains to be a loving husband to his wife and support to their children while forcefully and powerfully advancing, advancing the message of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And we thank God for him this morning. He's going to come now and deliver the word uh, by way of our Bible class. Let's receive him in Jesus' name. Dr. Bridges. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Certainly we give honor and praise to the Lord our God for his goodness and his mercy toward us, the children of men. Hallelujah. He is a good God. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our glory. He is worthy of all of the honor. And so we give it to him this morning and we give respect and we give reverence to uh, my brother. And uh, I didn't know he was gonna read that. I'll have to get that bio from him, whoever wrote that, thank you very much. Uh, but my brother, Assistant Council Chairman, District Elder Dan Smith, we thank the Lord for him. We thank the Lord for our Council Chairman, Bishop Dobbins, we thank God for him. And then we thank God for our diocesan Bishop, Bishop Vernon Spinks, thank God for each and every one of you, the saints of God, auxiliary officers, all of the rest of the Atlantic Regional Conference, and those who are joining us online. May the power that is on the scene be the power that you feel on the screen this morning. I am trying to do better uh, with making sure that I bring things with me. And so I come bearing gifts this morning. Uh, one of them is a children's book that I have authored called Love Wins. And the proceeds for this book go towards uh, families who are um, servicing children on the autism spectrum. And so I invite you, um, if you have not already purchased a copy of this children's book, Love Wins, to please support the ministry and the work that I do uh, with that and with supporting families with autis autistic children um, by purchasing this particular text. And if you say, well, Elder Bridges, I don't really have any children. Well, I've got something for you too. So uh, I just recently authored a book with a sister from my home church, Kingdom Apostolic Ministries, and Sister Shonda Golden and I have authored this particular text out of our failures. Uh, a lot of time people write from the position of the three keys to success, etc. But these are things that we have learned from our own experiences. And we invite you, if you have not already purchased this text, to purchase this text as well. Um, because we are an advanced council, one of the best councils on this side of glory. Amen. Yes. So 
We have, a, we have a wonderful administrative team and media team and technology team. And so they have provided a QR code for you to be able to access the worksheets for Bible study for today and tomorrow. Somebody said, I don't know about no QR code. Well, you can also visit terrencebridges.com. And if you visit terrencebridges.com, there is a tab at the top for the next two days. It says handouts. And if you click on that, you can download Bible study day one and Bible study day two. So we are being environmentally conscious. We are being technology re technologically relevant. We are moving forward. And so those are different ways that you can download the information and follow along with the presentation because I'm going to cover a lot of information in a little bit of time that we have together today. We are advancing the kingdom. And so that's what we are focusing on. That's what we are doing. And this is Bible study day one. And as we dive into Bible study day number one, we are going to look at advancing the kingdom. And so ahead is um, our scripture for this holy convocation, Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse number 10. And it says out of the word of the Lord in verse number 10, oh, now my clicker is working, praise the Lord. Let us all read together. Verse number 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. Amen. Your hand is still finding the passage. I'll go back so we can all read it together. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 10. When you found it, say amen. All right, let's read it together. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 10. Our theme for Holy Convocation, even for this session, is advancing the kingdom with the sub theme of all hands on deck, all boots on the ground is what my pastor would say, Bishop Gates, uh, all hands on deck, all boots on the ground. That is what we are seeking to do. That is what we are seeking to accomplish and embody in terms of who we are as the people of God. So what does it mean if we look at Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse number 10, I want to dive into a deeper depth of this passage. I am a more, in terms of my education and pedagogical practice, I am a facilitator, and so I like to come alongside as we learn together. So rather than lecturing you the whole time, I want to involve you in, and immerse you into this learning experience while we are together. So this is not a sermon. This is a Bible study, and so I'm going to interact and engage with you, and then I'm going to invite you who are comfortable uh, to interact and engage with me. I'm going to come to you on the floor and I'll hold the mic at six feet so that you have, <laughs> have some distance. But uh, uh, those of you who are comfortable, I do want to engage with those of you who are on the floor this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse number 10. There are several words that are underlined because there are words that stick out to me in this passage. Ecclesiastes is a wisdom passage. And so it is written by a man of great wisdom. This man of great wisdom, King Solomon, he prays to the Lord. And as he prays to the Lord, he prays to God not for riches. He prays to God not for more women. He prays to God not for more worth. He prays to God not for more wealth. He prays to God for what? Wisdom. And in God giving him wisdom, he is the wisest man on the face of the earth, he speaks to us about the meaning of our life and what is it that we will do with our life and things that we need to be conscious of as we make the most or maximize our life's potential. And I believe these words are outlined for us in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter and the 10th verse. If we look, these words are underlined. What's the first word that you see that is underlined? Just yell it out. Work, work. What's the second word? Device. What's the third word? Knowledge. And what's the fourth word? 
wisdom. I encourage you, if you have not already, um, um, I know that they tell us to put our phones up in church. I, infer, I encourage you to take your phone out, your smart device out, whatever it is, because there's a worksheet that goes along with this. At, um, and that worksheet is on the QR code, or that worksheet is also at terrencebridges.com. And my name is spelled T-E-R-R-A-N-C-E, T-E-R-R-A-N-C-E, bridges like bridges over troublewater.com. And if you click on handouts, Bible study, day number one, you will see this sheet. And on the top of the sheet, it says the dash. I'm going to explain what the dash means in just a moment. But Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse number 10, the, the wisdom writer gives us these words as tools and as strategy for us to maximize our life's potential. And those words are work, device, knowledge, and wisdom. Now look at this, work. Work specifically, when we define what is work, when we define what is work, work specifically, as we look at these devices to maximize our potential, to go forward, work. Work specifically deals with labor, deed, occupation, i.e., that is, the focus expenditure of energy in order to do or accomplish a goal or a task, as we talk about work. Exodus chapter 5, verse 13. Exodus chapter 5, verse 13. Can we get a floating mic? Can we get a floating mic? Exodus chapter 5, verse 13. Can someone read that for us? And we have the floating mic here. Exodus chapter 5, verse number 13. What does it say? in Exodus 5 and 13. Can I get a reader, amen, from the floor? Who's gonna be our reader today? And the taskmasters hasted them saying, fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. So when we see work, this is the same word that is used to refer to the Israelites as it related to their daily task that they were to accomplish for Pharaoh. So the word work here is daily task. What are the daily responsibilities that one must fulfill? What is the daily production that one must have? It's our practices, our customs, our energy regularly expended as to become a custom or a habit as a particular pattern of behavior. So that is our work. What is it that we do daily? What is it that we prioritize daily? What is it that we produce daily? There ought to be production on a daily basis. When God created us, Although culture has framed us into being consumers, God created us to be creators. If you're writing and taking notes, that's something good to write down. Culture has tried to mold us into the mentality of consumers, but God has created us to be creators. This is not on your handout, but go ahead and write it down. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and verse 27 says that we were created in the image of God. The imago dei is what they call it, the image of the divine. If we are created in the image of God, God as creator has created us to be creative. So that means that each day there ought to be something produced out of our lives. There ought to be something to show forth out of who we are as the created of the creator. And so it is important that we understand work from that perspective. What is your production on a daily basis? What's the second word? What's the second word? It's right there on the screen for you. What's the second word? Device. As we look at the word device, what does that mean? Device is uh, specifically defined as a plan, accounting, a reckoning, a rational thinking in decision making. You will see on the worksheet, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25 and 27. Lady Smith, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25 and through 27. Can you pass that back to her? Yes, thank you. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25 through 27, there is specifically a definition given us for device, device as opposed to work. What is device? I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reasons of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death than the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands, whoso pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Counting one by one to find out the account. This is the context in which the word device is used. It's understanding the divine arrangement or divine plan of the work. So it's not just us being creative but us being creative with a knowledge of a grander scheme or a grander plan in mind. And so as we look at a person's personal plans, that's the devices that are talked about in, in Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 25 through verse 27, is talking about personal plans. Our personal plans will lead us to what? Will lead us to bitterness. Our personal plans will lead us to a place of in productivity, I'm making up words, in productivity, unproductivity, our personal plans will lead us to the place of just being active, but active without any sense of purpose or any sense of direction. So as the writer of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, he talks about work. He talks about us being creative. He talks about us being active as people but not just simply being creative and being active as people, but to use device, which means to use strategy, which means to use plan. So there is a sense of purpose behind, there is purpose and plan behind the creative action that we have. So if we're to maximize our life's potential, I can not only just do work, a lot of us do work, but I have to work with a sense of device, strategic plan or purpose. So he's saying not just to work, but to work with plan and to work with purpose, to work with plan and to work with purpose, to work with plan and to work with purpose. Yeah, uh, some of y'all still don't get it. Um, I tell my students all the time, if the teacher repeats something, what's that mean? Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> work with plan and work with purpose. So to maximize my life's potential, I've got to go beyond work to device. So there has to be strategic plan for the actions that I'm making. But then the third thing that the psalmist point, excuse me, the uh, writer of the wisdom literature points out to us, I put them and coupled them together, although they are uniquely distinct from one another. But what are those two ideas in that third box that the ecclesiastical writer portrays for us. It is knowledge and what? Wisdom, knowledge and wisdom. So let's look at knowledge and wisdom. Um, I, and I'm just gonna forewarn my readers. I'm gonna go back to Elder McCormick. Genesis chapter two, verse number nine. Genesis chapter two, verse number nine. And then Lady Smith, Proverbs chapter two, verse number five. Let's hear Genesis 2, 9, knowledge and wisdom. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So knowledge, knowledge was a created element in the beginning of time. Knowledge was a created element in the beginning of time, and knowledge is understanding as defined by biblical dictionaries, uh, by uh, one particular bi biblical dictionary that I'm looking at is the Dictionary of Biblical Languages by James Swanson, and that's actually noted on your handout. But when we talk about knowledge, knowledge is actually understanding. Knowledge is a created thing. It's a created understanding. It's a created, listen to this, wisdom, and it's a knowledge with a focus on moral qualities as its application. So when we talk about knowledge, what you mean by that preacher? 
What I mean by knowledge is to have understanding, understanding. So it is not just knowing that something is there, but having understanding of why it is there and having moral application. So the ecclesiastical writer, when he speaks of knowledge, he speaks of it from the context of Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. There's the same word that is used, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of what? Good and evil, which means that there is a moral application. So not only must I be creative, not only must I be strategic, but I have to be aware of the good and of the evil of my action in order to maximize my life's potential. Is that making sense? If it's making sense, I say, get it. You say, got it, and we'll be good. Get it? Good. All right. So knowledge is this understanding, this wisdom, and this focus on moral qualities and its application. Lady Smith, what does Proverbs chapter 2, verse 5 say? Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find what? The knowledge of God. Knowledge is not simply a knowing a fact, but knowledge is a reverence. Knowledge is, remember I said moral applications. Knowledge is a reverence for the creator in what it is that we're doing, okay? And so if we're to maximize our life's potential, if our work is to be fruitful, then it has to be a moral application that is also given to our work. Well, we've always been taught that knowledge is facts and wisdom is knowing how to apply them, right? Well, when we look more specifically at the definitions that are given in the scripture and how the words are used in the scripture, knowledge actually requires wisdom if it's to be used in a biblical fashion. Knowledge requires the application. Knowledge requires knowing the good and the evil. Knowledge requires the reverence for God in order for it to be fully used. Now we look at wisdom. Wisdom is the skill or the technical ability to do a craft. It is the technical use of our knowledge. There is a scripture in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verse number six, you say, preacher, you are given a whole lot of scriptures that I don't see on the screen. Well, they're on the worksheet. They're on the worksheet. They're on page one of the worksheet and knowledge and wisdom are put together and these scriptures are there. But Deuteronomy chapter four, verse number six, one of my readers, whoever finds that first, if they would be willing to read that for us. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse number six, what does it say? Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. This is a wise and understanding people. So knowledge is an awareness of good and evil. Knowledge deals with the reverence for our creative, knowing why we are doing the action that we are doing. But wisdom then becomes the application or wisdom becomes the why we are doing it. Wisdom is not what we are doing, but why we are doing what we are doing. And so there is this element of work. There's this element of device strategically placing our actions together. There's this element of knowledge, ethics, uh, this reverence for our creator in what it is that we're doing. And then there is wisdom knowing why we are doing what we are doing. So instead of just living and doing things, instead of just coming to church and doing things, there needs to be an awareness of why we are doing what we are doing. I'm reminded, Elder Sawyer, of, uh, of uh, an example that I was given as a child. When I went into the kitchen with my grandmother, my grandmother would cut off the ends of the ham. And she would cut off the ends of the ham before she seasoned it real good, before she marinated it with the, um, with the pineapple juice and the other stuff. I didn't watch too closely. Um, I didn't watch too closely uh, Evangelist Venable because I didn't know, I didn't really like ham that much. But um, when she took the pineapple juice, she poured the pineapple juice over and she put some, like some brown sugar and some other seasonings in there, but she would cut off the ends of the ham before she put it in the oven. And I said, Grandma, why do you cut off the ends of the ham? Grandma couldn't tell me why she cut off the ends of the ham. 
Grandma cut off the ends of the ham because her mama cut off the ends of the ham. And her mama cut off the ends of the ham. And every person that I asked, why do you cut off the ends of the ham before you cook the ham, could not give me a response. Well, I found out one day, Elder Sawyer, that the original action of cutting off the ends of the ham came from the size of the cabinet of the oven. They cut off the ends of the ham because the ham was manufactured larger than the cabinets of the oven. But as time went on and technology advanced, the size of ovens became larger. And so a ham in its wholeness could fit into the oven. So we were being wasteful in cutting off the ends of the ham still, not realizing why we were doing what we were doing. We were becoming wasteful with the resources that we had. Now, I'm not criticizing grandma because grandmama could burn. Woo. Grandmama could cook real good. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Homemade food is better than any of this other stuff. I'm telling you that right now. Bojangles ain't got nothing on grandma. I'm telling you that right now. But even so, because she did not know the why, she was being wasteful. If we are not careful with the why we are doing what we are doing in the context of ministry, in our churches, ministry, in our families, some of the things that we do in terms of ministry, in our preaching, some of the things that we do in terms of ministry, in our teaching, while we are working, we will still be wasteful. So it is important that we come to an understanding what the writer of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 tells us is to come to an understanding of why it is that you are doing what it is that you are doing. Why do you get up and go to work every morning? Why do you clock in every morning at a certain time? Why are you the one who is the prime and the foremost in terms of an employee, an example on your job? Why is it that you have the church at a council every three months? Why is it that you're serving in an auxiliary? Why is it that you are continuing to give your money to this organization and to this body? Why? You must know the why or else you will be wasteful with the resources that God has given. Get it? Get it? Good. All right, let's move on. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 9 in verse number 10 is on page one of your handout. The whole thing is on page one of your handout. Look at this. Look at this. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 10. But when we read that scripture in its entirety, it actually goes beyond verse number 10. Let's look now at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I want to actually start looking at verse number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, start looking at verse number 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy. Enjoy your carbs. See, I can have carbs. The word said I can have carbs. Amen. All this keto and stuff. No, I'm just playing. And drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works, that thy garments be always white. Wash your clothes and let thy head lack no ointment. Put on lotion. All right. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor, which thou takest under the sun. In other words, enjoy everything that you have while you have it. So there's this sense of work, but there's also this sense of enjoyment. And then it says in verse number 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. That's our text. But our text in the larger context of this passage is that we are to enjoy everything to the fullest. How am I going to enjoy life to its fullest? I have to be aware of my work. I have to be aware of my devices. I have to be aware of knowledge 
and wisdom. I have to be aware of number one, what? I have to be aware, number two, of what? I have to be aware, number three and four, of what? Knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom. You guys are good. Praise the Lord for this wonderful class. Who are you guys? The Atlantic Regional Conference, the best class, the best class, this side of glory. Amen. And so look at this. Being born, when you are born, at the time of your birth, the time of your birth is what? It's considered what? A moment. If you're writing on the PDF, if your smart device allows you to write on the PDF, or if you're taking notes to go along with the worksheet, write this down. Being born is what? A moment. Life. If you look at the second picture, life is a process. We see the baby in the corner. We see the man working. We see the man moving with his venti espresso in his head. We see the man working and moving. Life is a process. But then death again is what? A moment. Death is a moment. Birth is a moment. But life is a process. How do we gain the most out of the process of life? When you look at this, what, what, what is it that you see when you look at this? You see the tombstones. Have you ever gone throughout the graveyard and looked at tombstones? Most of the tombstones have a name, and what do they have? The date of birth and the date of death. And then there's that small dash between. The small dash represents the greatest portion of the person's life. But yet it is on the tombstone listed the moment that they were born and the moment that they what? Die. But really what is important is the smallest thing that is listed on the tombstone, the dash. The question that I wanted to ask you today, and that this is the purpose of our study. That's why it's listed at the top of your worksheet. The question I want to ask you today is, what are you doing with your dash? What are you doing with your dash? Because it is not necessarily the date that you were born that is the most important. It is not the day that you died, Pastor Stanley, that's the most important. But what is the most important is what are my hands doing with the dash? What will your epitaph read? Take time. If you were to die, what do you want? I, I know it may seem a little um, gothic and it may seem a little morbid, but think about this. And I, this question is in the worksheet. I'm on, I'm on page two or page one at the bottom of the worksheet. What would your epitaph read? What would the statement of you be? Because the statement of who you will be, it didn't come from the day you were born. It didn't come from the day you died. The statement of who you will be on that epitaph is because of the dash. I want you to honestly take time, those of you who are joining us from virtual land, Take time, pull up your notepad on your smart device. Take time, grab a piece of paper. Take time, write according to the scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. If you're in the notes of your Bible, in the margin of your Bible, or in a piece of paper, whatever you have to write with. Right now, I want you to think, what do I want my epitaph to say? Write it down. What do I want my epitaph to say? Got a floating mic around here somewhere. I want, I want to hear some people share. What do you want your epitaph to say? What is it that you want your epitaph to read? Anybody? Elder McCormick. I want mine to say that I, that I helped people, that I did something good for the Lord, that the Lord was pleased with me. That you help people, that you did something good for the Lord, that the Lord was pleased with you. Can I get a couple other people to share? What do you want your epitaph to say? I know this is a little bit morbid in terms of thinking, but it's a reality. Yes, Elder. That I accomplished my God-given purpose. 
that you accomplished your God given purpose. Thank you for sharing. Can I get one other person to share? Somebody share on Facebook what it is, or somebody share on WebEx what it is that you want your epitaph to say. What is it that you want your epitaph to say? And can I get one more person in the sanctuary to share? What is it that you want your epitaph to say? Yes, Elder Sawyer, right here. He left it all here. He, woo, I like that. He left it all here. He left it all here. Think about each of these people's statements that they've made. What are you doing now? What are you doing now to live into that legacy? And what will you do with the process? Because remember, the dash is a process. What will you do with the process and the experience? So principles for maximizing your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. So I need to look. How do I know what it is that I'm doing right now? I need to look at number one, I need to look at my work. Number two, I need to look at my, did somebody's paying attention. Number three, I need to, and wisdom. How am I using these things? Let's look at page two of the handout. How are you using these things? How are you operating in this way, in this regard? Ecclesiastes chapter nine. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, when you look at verse number 4 through 9, it's also ahead on the screen. Those of you who are joining us, unless you're driving, read this with us. Let's all read it out loud. It's on the screen. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. What are you doing to maximize the moment? Because the reality is after you have died, it really all means nothing. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Let's continue to read. Also their love and their hatred. I can't hear you and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go thy way. Uh-oh, come on, work with me, technology. What happened to it? Thou takest under the sun. So if it is important for me to go thy way, Eat thy bread, like I read earlier, eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart. Go backwards, going too far ahead. For God now accepteth thy works. So enjoy and maximize each moment. Maximize the element of time that you are given. Make the most of what you have been given. Let's look at work. When we look at work, Genesis chapter 11, it says, now the whole earth had uh, one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said one to another, what did they say? All right, all right, all right, can y'all see it? Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So they talked about doing what? They talked about working together, right? Okay, and so they had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves what? A city. We're going to build ourselves a city. So they had their strategic plan. They had their devices. Okay, they had their work. And a tower whose tops is in where? The heavens. Let us do what? Make a name for ourselves. We're going to make a name for ourselves, Atlantic Regional Conference. Why are we doing the work that we're doing? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Why are we doing the work that we're doing, praise Him? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Why are we doing what we're doing, St. Louis? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Why are we doing what we're doing, Richard? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Elder Judd, we're going to make a name for ourselves. You're going to remember my name. 
put some respect on it. That's what they said, Genesis chapter 11. But what does God do? In verse number seven, he says, come, let us. Us is not a reference to plural, but we learn from our previous bishop, Bishop Otto Richardson, that the Lord counsels with his own self. And so he says, come, let us go down and there con 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 confuse their language because they may not understand one another's speech. But if you look in verse number six, I read verse number seven first, but if you put it in reverse, in verse number six, he says, the Lord said, indeed, the people are what? One. And they all have what? One language. They're speaking the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be what? Withheld from them. There are some principles in that. This is, a, this is not a Bible study on unity, though. But there are some principles shown in that. When we become one, one in mind, and one in language, the Lord said, there is nothing that we can't do. That's what the Lord said. And so there is power in unity. But God brings confusion. Why does God bring confusion to their unity? Because who were they trying to make a name for? Themselves. So they're going to build this great big tower to the heavens. They're going to reach up to the heavens. They're going to make something grander. They're going to make something glorious. They're going to make something great. But they have the work. They have the device, but where they fall short is in the knowledge, in the wisdom, in the reverence, in the respect for the creator. They become creative, but the lack of reverence and respect for the creator and knowing why they are doing what they are doing, they become wasteful. So what does the Lord have to do? He sends confusion. A lot of times when we see people operating in confusion in their lives, when you're doing a lot of things but don't have a lot to show for it, we have to go back and evaluate our knowledge and our wisdom. Why is it that you're doing what you're doing? Because if you don't know your why, you become what? Wasteful. Thank you, Lady Speaks. Somebody with me today. <laughs> when you don't know your why, you become wasteful. Think of all of the tools that it took to build that tower. Can you imagine the work, the labor, the amount of manpower it took to lift those bricks with the asphalt, with the mortar from the asphalt? the bricks to build these towers to the heavens. Sounds familiar to me. Sounds like those great pyramids. A little something like them, except for this one was even greater and grander. But somebody tell me where the Tower of Babel is. Anybody know? Anybody seen Tower of Babel? Anybody visited Tower of Babel? Well, y'all didn't get y'all season pass to the Tower of Babel? Why? Because it's not there. And do work, and your work will be wasteful if you don't know your why. And it will not last. Do not want my life to be a waste. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes said, a living dog is better than what? Dead lion. What are you doing with the life that you have now not to waste it? Lord, can you repeat after me? Lord, Lord, give clear revelation of what I am to be doing in this season so I will not be wasteful. In Jesus' name, Lord, give clear revelation of what I'm going to be doing in this season so that I will not be wasteful. I do not want to spend time building something 
that is worthless and something that will not mean anything to the next generation. What is it that we are building? So what? You got a logo. So what? You got a mission statement. So what? You got objectives. So what? Your treasury is filled. So what? You got a position. So what? You got a title. So what? You got a certificate on the wall. What are you leaving for the next generation? Where is that tower? We don't know. It's all Babel. Let's go on. Look at this when we talk about work. John chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, Jesus speaks to his disciples. He says, I want your life to be fruitful. I want your life to bring forth much fruit. And so I put John chapter 15 on the screen for you. It's out of the New Living Translation. And I did this for the purpose of clarity, just to give clear understanding. He said, I am the grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of vine that doesn't what? Produce fruit. If you don't produce, you are worthless. Every branch that does not bear fruit is worthless. God is a quality and a intelligent and an intentional investor. God is not wasteful. If God made you, he had intention in mind, he had an investment in mind, and whatever he put out, he wants a return on his investment. How many of you go and put money in your savings account at the bank and then go back the next day and they tell you you ain't got no money and there is, there's no problem? You say, oh, okay, that's fine. God bless you. Have a good day. No, you don't do that. When you put money in the bank, you expect to go back and get what you put in. For those of you who are involved in investing, when you get involved in investing, your portfolio manager, if they come back to you one month, two months, and your portfolio is down, okay, I understand the market's down a little bit right now. I'm gonna hang in there. They come back to you two and three years and four years and five years later, and you have less money than what you put in, you, are you still gonna to continue to use that portfolio manager? Anybody who shake their head, yes, see me afterwards. I want to talk to you. I got some things I want you to invest in. You wouldn't. Why? Because you expect a return on your investment. What return are we giving God on his investment? What return are we giving God on what he has placed within us? God does not expect you just to give back to him what he gave to you. He expects you to give back even more because you are to be fruitful. It's not on your sheet, but write it down. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells the parable of the 10 talents and the different servants who were given different levels of talents. The servant who was given the least number of talents, he did what? He went and he buried it. And then when his master came back and asked him, what did you do with what I gave you? He said, I knew that you were a wicked master, that you reap where you did not sow, that you were gathering where you did not plant. And so I went and I hid it. I brought you back what you gave me. But he called him what? Wicked. He brought him back what he gave him. When you bring back God simply what he gave you, you are not doing what God expected you to do. If we do not take what God gave us to produce more fruitfulness, Jesus says in John chapter 15, you'll be what? Cut off. I don't want any branches that just look pretty, but that don't bear any fruit. How many churches, how many ministries do we have in our churches that look pretty and we have them because the church down the street has them? We have them because the national body has them. We have them because the council next door has them but they're bearing no fruit and we have them just to have them so that we can look pretty like everybody else, but it's not bearing fruit. What does Jesus do? He cut it off. What do we need to do? Cut it off. 
cut it out. If it's not bearing fruit, cut it out. Look at somebody tell them, cut it out. God expects us to produce more than what he has given us. I know I'm not going to make it all the way through all of this. And so I'm just going to reference these scriptures now. But if you look, look at the example. The people were committed to making a name for themselves. That's on page two of the worksheet. The people were committed to building to be the greatest. But the Lord brought confusion to their efforts because of their selfishness and because of their selfish ambition. In Philippians chapter two, Philippians chapter two, this clicker really does not like me today. Philippians chapter two, verse three and four, it says, let us do nothing out of Philippians chapter two, verse three and four says, let us do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit is what some translations say, or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you uh, look out not only for his own ministry. Oh, does it say ministry? Oh, okay. <laughs> look out not only for his own church, I mean, interest. And look out not only for his own title position. Oh, uh, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. That's the word. I, I don't think I need to even say any more about that. Work is to be directed selflessly. When we talk about work, work is to be the consideration of what? The interest of others. Look at page four in your handout. Page number four in your handout. And page number four in your handout, Jesus talks about moving work and he mo talks about moving work and being fruitful. The only way you can be fruitful is if you abide in him or if you live in the place of intimacy. Intimacy. Intimacy with God. How many of us spend time doing the work of God more than we spend time with God? I have been guilty. I tell you right now, standing behind this pulpit in this sanctified Holy Ghost filled church, Sister Anthony, I have been guilty of doing the work of God without spending the same or a greater amount of quality time with God. It's interesting that in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, you all know that story, so I'm not going to read it all. But Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, you say, this is a lot of scriptures, preacher. Well, we're doing Bible study, right? I'm not preaching. We're doing Bible study. And it's on your handout. It's on the worksheet. But we see Mary and Martha. Mary does what? She comes and she sits at the feet of Jesus. Martha goes in the kitchen. What is Martha doing? Huh? She working. Lord, I'm working for you. She working hard for the money. Martha was in the kitchen working. That don't make no sense. In the kitchen, I'm sweating. In the kitchen, and I'm slaving. Knowing these men is hungry. They done come here. They done been out preaching and everything else, and she got the nerve to sit at Jesus' feet. I'm in this kitchen working. What's verse number 41 say? But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Verse 42, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen what? The good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Position, taken away. Ministry, taken away. Auxiliary, taken away. Do you know, you may not believe it, but my wife is my witness. I've had people call me on the phone and tell me, you know, I think Bishop is thinking about moving me, but can't nobody do that ministry like I can do it. I promise you, if I'm lying, I'm flying, and my feet are still on the ground. I've had people come to me in church, Elder Sawyer, and tell me, I, I can't be moved because nobody can do that better than me. We get so caught up in what we're doing and we forget about the why. The why is not going to be taken from her. 
So in my work, where is my worship? In my work, where is my intimacy? So I keep on, you know, they have all these, uh, you go to the store now, mother, they have these things and you see those stickers on your fruit sometimes it says what, non-GMO. You know what that means? Can you say it out loud, please, evangelist? Genetically modified means that it has not been genetically modified. So a lot of the food that we eat now is not even real food. Y'all know that? Y'all know tilapia is not a real fish. I'm just, just so you know. But then they put the sticker on some food and it actually is more expensive because it's not genetically modified. It's not manufactured or created out of nothing. Question, what would be the worth of your work if it was more than just about the appearance and producing work and actually producing something of substance that came from your own intimacy with God? A lot of times we do work and present that as our worship. Jesus said, no, 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 you got it backwards. I want your worship to produce your work. So the question for us today is, there's the date you're born. There's the date you die. The question is, what are you going to do with the dash in between? If you look, I think it's on page, is it page two of that handout, that worksheet? There's a quote. Do you guys see it? On page two of the handout, a quote at the top. I think there's a quote by Mark Twain at the top of that handout on page two of the worksheet. It's not on the slides, it's on the worksheet. The, yes, what's to say the two most important, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. What are you going to do with your dash? God bless you. Let's give the Lord another nice hand praise, everyone. Come on, let's give the Lord a nice hand praise. Amen. I appreciate the Lord today for such a profound type study. It provokes thought in us. And if nothing else, right at the very end, amen, what will we do with the dash? Amen. It's so important. We have, amen, a responsibility to be mentors of this way in Christ, to show somebody that we can walk in light as he's in light, amen, and be able to live a holy life. One of the things that the Lord always troubles my mind is, is that we are supposed to have a ready answer for any man that asks of this hope that lies within us. Now, he has to see something in order to determine that there is a hope within us. And so our life then must be one that generates a question. All right, let us say amen again for the word of God. We've come to this portion, amen. We want to receive an offering from you, amen, as we prepare for our lunch break in Jesus' name. Uh, is Deacon Pettis, come on Deacon, let's get this offering in the house. You that are viewing virtually, amen, we want you also to be generous and kind to us during this convocation time, amen. Give, you can go to the website, there are different uh, methods for giving there. Amen. You can give with your credit card. You can give with GiveLify. You can give with Cash App. Amen. There are different methods there. If you'll search it out, amen, you'll find the way to give. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, and the liberal soul shall be made fat. Amen. So we thank the Lord for this. We want you to know that you go to lunch. Amen. When we do break, we will go to lunch. Amen. At your own location. Amen. And do what... Uh, get yourself refreshed and ready to come back at 1 o'clock. Everybody say 1 p.m. All right, we want to be back at 1 p.m. Uh, so we can get started with our Global Missions Workshop in Jesus' name. All right, God bless you. Deacon Pettis is at the front of the assembly area. 
Amen. Let us come on and get ready to give in Jesus' name. All right, you may stand. Come on, bring your offerings in Jesus' name. While you're moving to give your offering, we want you to know, amen, they do have lunch prepared here at the church. Amen, in Jesus' name. Uh, they have a list of items, vegetable chicken soup combo, small side salad with some lemonade. Amen. Soup and crackers. Uh, huh? No hot dogs. Oh, we don't have any hot dogs today. All right, got grilled chicken salad. Uh, combo, $7. That uh, vegetable chicken soup combo, amen, is $6. The soup and crackers is $4. Amen. It'll be good for you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Uh, and there are no hot dogs today. They got some desserts, some extras, brownies, cookies, lemonade. Amen. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy the fellowship. I was just telling someone this morning, or was it last night, that one of the reasons we come together at a location for this council is so that we can enjoy the fellowship one of the other. Bible asked the question, oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. So let us take this opportunity, amen, to greet your brethren and sisters. If they are uh, showing you a particular cautionary tale, amen, give them that six feet of space. Come on, somebody, say amen. Keep your mask handy, and let's do what God would have us to do so that we can have great respect one for the other and do a great job in Jesus' name. And when we come back after lunch, amen, we'll go into our workshops or the missions departments. Amen. The first one that will be on tap, uh, let's see, I believe it will be the Global Missions Workshop. Uh, and the presenter is Evangelist Jack, uh, Jasmine Black. And I had the pleasure of hearing her uh, at a unity service that uh, Elder Stanley conducted at our church. You don't want to miss this kind of person. Amen. This kind of presenter in Jesus' name. So God bless you in Jesus' name. Uh, go ahead and bless it, uh, Elder Pettis. God bless you real good. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being attentive today. You can consider yourself, amen, on break at this point. We're not dismissing from the council, amen, but we're going to take this break for lunch. Amen in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. Shoot.